I think I told you I had several friends, um, a family that tested positive back east. And, um, and I still have concerns about my, my colleagues and friends here in, uh, on the West Coast. That happened uh, on the East Coast. And um, with the um, probably greater than 95,000 deaths worldwide with this COVID pandemic, and I think our numbers are passing the 16,000 mark in the USA uh, with deaths from the COVID, um, it's quite real. The reality of this virus is um, not arguable. It's reality for us. And um, because Gold Medical is all about healthcare workers and uh, the, the employers and the employees, I think that it warrants a conversation and um, um, a discussion about where we are today. So it seems, it seems if you uh, check into the news, which most of us are, um, my husband is chronically leaving the TV on. We have an upstairs and a downstairs and he's chronically leaving the TV on, whether he's in front of it or not, just to not miss any of it. Um, it's on his computer and it's on the televisions and it's on the radios. And um, I think it's wise to check in because Things have changed from uh, February to March to now we're in April. And uh, I'm actually speaking to you on uh, what many of the world uh, know as Holy Saturday. It's the day before Easter. And um, so things have changed in the last uh, month and a half or so from, from learning what was happening in China and then Italy and then finally hitting home. Um, I've watched some of the programs about what occurred in Puget Sound in the state of Washington and um, listened to some of the reports from the nurses and doctors that uh, were, were first faced with it and were, um, you know, everybody was aware of it. Healthcare, everybody was aware of it. Most of the hospitals were, uh, letting their staff know of the crisis that had occurred in China and that with the travel in the world that we, you know, should be prepared and, and, um, and we're reviewing, uh, you know, procedures and policies and, and safety measures and so forth. But um, nothing really prepares you well enough uh, like the Boy Scouts, you know, be prepared, um, and the military and healthcare workers, all of us, nothing really prepares you well enough for the actual occurrence. Like my daughter, um, now my, my beautiful godchild, um, is, um, she'll be in two days, she'll be exactly three weeks young. And nothing really prepared my daughter, all her studiousness and preparation and, and uh, research and so forth and conversations with, you know, her in-laws and with myself and so forth. Nothing actually can prepare you for your first uh, labor and delivery. And nobody wants to say too much because everybody's story um, is their own story. And, um, and we don't, we didn't know what her story would be, but we did tell her labor's a lot of work and it's different for everyone and that we hope that hers will would go smoothly and and so forth and she pushed for closer to four hours than three hours and she labored for uh well over 20 hours so there's nothing that can prepare you for that actuality and and she's fine and the baby's fine and her husband's fine and so forth so that's the good news so um so nothing could prepare us for this pandemic um, completely, the experience of it is a, a is another whole story. So, um, what I'm thinking is, how are we burdened? How are you burdened? I'm thinking of you all. Um, I have not been clinical. Even my volunteer job um, has been put on hold. I used to a volunteer every week to shower the homeless, and um, 
for everyone's safety, that has shut down. And um, so I think there's a couple of things going on that are a burden. And I think, um, I not only think, I've researched, that one of the uh, burdens would be the mental health um, crisis that is occurring and will probably um, continue to occur. So it's sort of like um, any crisis, um, like post-traumatic stress, that, right? So um, our soldiers go to war, our military goes to war, and it's hell, and um, but they deal with it. You know, they do what they have to do. They, they keep people safe, they prevent, you know, bombs from going off and, and all kinds of uh, things occur, uh, you know, enemy fire and friendly fire and, and accidents occur and so forth, uh, accidents, war is hell. And so, but they function just like we as healthcare workers function. I can remember, you know, many, many moons ago when I was working in the ICU and afterwards, some other nurse or some other doctor would say, well, you really handled that well, you were really calm. And I thought, I'm so glad you think so because my heart was pounding and I was, you know, uh, providing uh, CPR and electrical shock and so forth. And um, I was doing my job. It's when you back away a little bit, you have a time to, you have the time to process that, um, that's when you feel the pressure, the pressure and the burdens. So, so uh, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. So, um, so what's occurring? Okay, we're uh, emptying of our hospital. We're emptying our hospitals of anyone we abs that absolutely can uh, be taken care of at home or in a, um, a different facility, a long-term facility. Um, we are, you know freeing up those beds for uh, COVID patients and the most acutely ill. Uh, ORs have turned into ICUs and, uh, you know, we've cut way back on uh, surgeries and uh, or, or physicians of various backgrounds have suddenly become ER physicians. Um, and uh, tragically, some of our colleagues have become patients. So those are things in our wildest dreams we weren't expecting. Okay. And so, um, so is there a positive side to it? Yes. If you read some of the interviews from, um, you know, the, the, um, the reporting magazines, the Washington Post, Time Magazine, um, newspapers and so forth, they will say most of the physicians and nurses out there have um, felt a, a surge, a renewal of their dedication to their profession and that, um, that desire to help and, uh, and heal. And um, that has been a positive. On the negative side, uh, it out it really does outnumber that positive that surge of like i am in the profession i love and i am going to um do everything i can i'm gonna uh, whatever it takes the amount of hours and so forth um but on the on the flip side of that there's frustration there's frustration because they can't help in in many cases there's well there really is no a bona fide treatment for this virus. Most viruses, you know, Tamiflu, I mean, we lose so many patients every year, um, usually with underlying problems, you know, the very young and the very old are most vulnerable to disease. Um, but there's no actual antiviral. We have the Tamiflu, you know, we have a lot of symptomatic relief, but we don't have any cures. We get vaccinated, that's our best bet. And if you've had uh, like my son-in-law, I told him how lucky he was when he told me he had the swine flu years ago when the H1N1 was uh, a terrible flu that uh, came out. I can't remember. It's quite a few years ago now, but he had it. And I said, how lucky you are now, Daniel, because now you have antibodies. Um, so, so we're frustrated. 
because we don't really have a treatment. We're frustrated because we don't have uh, the proper protective equipment in a lot of cases. We don't have, it's, it's changing day by day, but these are the things that have been happening for the last month and a half to my colleagues and, and my professional friends. Um, their, their fear has uh, skyrocketed because of their exposure. Oh, there I am touching myself, right? We're not supposed to touch ourselves. Well, I'm very fortunate not to be sick and I will wash my hands after the video before I touch anybody or anything. Um, but the, my, my colleagues are afraid, of course, for themselves, but much more, much more paramount is their fear of bringing something home to their family. So a lot of my friends are um, very isolated, even if they're still living in a home with, with a husband and children or uh, a wife living with a husband or a husband living with a wife and children, they're isolating themselves because they just don't know. The incubation period is a while sometimes before you see symptoms. So, excuse me. So they're frustrated because um, and fearful because they don't want to bring anything to their family. They're frustrated because they can't help their patients enough, and um, and they're really just sad because there are demises. There are patients dying. And um, they're sad. That's sad. It's never, you know, we're, we're uh, helpers and healers. And so we want to uh, help people get well and feel better. And when we can't, that's, that's another major frustration. So, um, so what is the experience um, that, um, that may lead to a mental health crisis? Well, if that... If all of those things, all of those fears and frustrations don't um, resolve, they continue over and over. Uh, you may be working too hard, work, sleep, eat, back to work, work, sleep, eat, back to work. You know, so that, that cycle, as, as um, that continues, there's depression, there's anxiety, there's uh, insomnia. You know, you're so exhausted and yet you can't sleep. And um, just a, a general... A sense of distress. You're not able to fix yourself. You're not able to fix others. And um, I'll tell you one story I heard uh, or read. It was a nurse. Oh, it was a nurse's story. And the husband was not doing well. And the family could not visit because they don't have any you're banned um, from going in the hospital. So not only is it um, sad, it's very lonely. Uh, how sad is that when your family member is ill? Like when my daughter was in labor and nobody came to get her and she's hobbling into the hospital on her own looking for the labor and delivery unit. And I had to say goodbye in the parking lot. Um, so, so people that are very, very sick and being admitted to the hospital and the ICUs and the ERs and so forth, are being kind of left like that. The family members left outside, out in the cold, basically. And um, so this nurse would do what she could. She would go visit the family outside the hospital and give progress reports. The doctors would do the same. And this nurse said she wanted to help somehow. And she asked the wife if there was any message she could give her husband. And she said, please tell him how much we love him and please let him know it's okay to let go. We understand and we love him. And so that nurse delivered that message. And how could that not affect her? That almost breaks my heart and gives me chills to repeat that story. So, um, so, so yeah, so all these things are very sad and very distressing. And, and there are these lonely deaths and uh, so forth. Um, and in the long-term facilities, in the nursing homes, and the senior living um, facilities and so forth, what, um, what can they do? What can they do with their stress, and, and how are they managing their stress? Well, we, I don't think we've seen the, the fallout of that completely yet. Um, 
because we're all so isolated. I mean, everything you see, the site that I'm speaking to you on, um, they're, they have a motto, I mean, they have a logo, and in that logo now, it says, stay home, right? So, um, yeah, so we're not as connected as we once were. Um, we have, you know, ways to connect. I mean, we are so fortunate to have the smartphones and the television and the computers and the communication and the, um, you know, the different ways to connect with people that way. But the actual connection, yeah, I, I, if you could see me, I'm opening and I'm tense talking about it because it's a, it's a difficult, difficult time. And yet there's always something to be grateful for. But um, a doctor I read, an infectious disease doctor um, said, that she she is an advisor and an, uh, an infectious disease doctor that advises long-term care uh, facilities and we've been through that the l tax the long-term acute the long-term uh, skilled the long-term um, senior uh, memory care and so forth so these facilities um, are experiencing some of some of the similar disturbances that the very acute ICUs and ERs are experiencing, and that is uh, being understaffed, having insufficient testing to find out uh, who and who not, who and who is not positive for COVID. Um, they're, um, they're, they're very, very restricted on who can come in and out of the facilities. They're short staffed. Um, and, um, and they feel kind of helpless. And so what happens with all of these things, you know, understaffed, overworked, um, undersupplied, you know, their, their policy procedures are only as good as, as their knowledge and their equipment and they're short on equipment. And, um, so their stress builds. So when you get to an extreme level of stress, and add some of those things that I talked about, the depression, the anxiety, the insomnia, what's going to happen? Mistakes. You have an increase in mistakes and errors and, you know, mid errors. And, and um, it's very distressing. It's distressing to talk about, but it's a reality. And so, um, so they're probably going to experience burnout and what we would like to do to help them to avoid a chronic burnout and, and, you know, get back to that level where they love their profession and they love what they do. Um, we, what can we do as an individual, as a colleague? Um, so um, if someone like I'm isolated because I'm trying to be safe, right. And I don't, I have a newborn here. My husband and I are technically seniors. So we're isolating ourselves. And when we do have to go out, you know, to, to get groceries or to, to go to the pharmacy or I'm responsible for um, uh, my cousin who is not, um, not in a facility but has a lot of disabilities, uh, physical and mental. Um, so we have to bring things to her and um, accommodate that and so forth. So when we do go out, we are gloved, we are masked. Not that we're ill, but we just don't know. We don't know if on any of these trips to the grocery store, to my cousin's apartment, um, uh, to the gas station, to you know the pharmacy, wherever we're going, that um, we take extra precaution. One, one, the mask will help you somewhat but also really the mask is to prevent others from getting any of your droplets. And then gloves, because you're touching things, the inside and outside of your car and the groceries and so forth. And we're carrying hand sanitizer everywhere, which I've been doing that for many, many years, but I don't think I've used it as much and needed it as much as I do nowadays. But, um, but those are the things you can do. You can help others who cannot help themselves. So you can bring food, you can bring uh, positive messages, you can bring um, um, some, you know, books, um, magazines, uh, music, maybe a, a favorite uh, CD, um, 
medication, if they need something from the pharmacy, you can bring that kind of goodwill to the community, to the family member, to the colleague. And I'm so grateful my friend back East who is such a generous person with her time and her talent and her, um, her knowledge and um, her positive attitude. She's always helping someone. I mean, I can't even tell you how many hours and, and miles this woman puts on helping people all over, uh, you know, town to town and, and so forth. She's wonderful. And I was so thrilled to hear, you know, when I couldn't be there except on a phone or, or, or a video chat, um, that others like her sister-in-law and others were um, helping when she and her husband, her two, adult, two of her adult children were um, tested positive and, and experiencing symptoms that they were delivering food and good messages and books. And um, I'm so grateful and uh, that that happened. And um, you don't have to deliver anything. You, if you know someone that is distressed or ill or burnt out, um, you can just listen. You can send them a text or um, a message and say, hey, I'm here anytime you need. Um, I just watched a great show. I just heard a great joke. Um, call me when you wake up. I'm here, you know, just, just be there. Give of your time, you know, and, um, and be prepared because I think that um, everybody's working so hard. My, my, one of my dearest, dearest friends is a respiratory therapist, and she's put in a lot, a lot of hours and extra hours and been in the ER and been on the front line and been in the ICU and um, has not been able to see well, one daughter lives out of town, but has not been able to see her daughter and her grandchild and her son-in-law. And uh, because she is on the front lines and does um, is isolated with her husband, and um, she is she is a great spirit also. But she is. Um, I'm just wondering. You know, I have to keep checking in with her, and I I think. What happens, like I started to say earlier, like our soldiers and, and people that have uh, are involved in crisis and, and uh, near death and death experiences, and that sometimes it's not till you slow down when you uh, finally walk away from the fire, uh, when, you, when you leave work and you've had uh, a patient die, maybe more than one patient. Uh, maybe a patient you've been taking care of for the last several weeks that showed improvement, which often happens and then and then uh, passed away. Um, that that is when be prepared that when the quiet, when you have time to ponder, when you're not so busy, when you're not just going to work, coming home, eating and sleeping, um, when you're not that overwhelmed. Um, and you have time to ponder it, that's when you may get more distressed. And that's when we need to be as supportive as we can with our time and our talent and our generosity and our love, um, with the food, with the shoulder to cry on, and with that encouragement. If they're like, oh, but I'm so busy and they need me and they keep calling me in for these shoes, it's, it's okay. It's okay to take care of yourself for a day or two, or a week. That is okay. Um, we want to avoid mistakes, and we want to be able to carry on. We want to continue to be uh, nurses and nurse aides and doctors and respiratory therapists um, for as long as we want to continue our career. So um, I know you're burdened. I know we have a worldwide pandemic. Um, I know we're not done, and I know we're doing pretty fantastic job, all things considered. And um, let's just be there for one another in any way we can. And what else did I want to talk about? I think, I think that I think that um, being that supportive person 
has its own burdens because you always feel like, am I doing enough? Did they, was I able to help them? You know, we, because we're healthcare workers, that's part of our makeup. You know, we want to help. And um, even if we're not on the front lines, like I am not on the front lines, um, it's important for me to be helpful. And so I'll just keep reaching out, doing the best I can. And then I think that's it. You have to say, I'm going to do the best I can. And, um, and take care of yourself. We're no good to anyone else if we don't take care of ourselves. Okay? So we're here. Gold Medical is not going anywhere. We are changing our name. It's going to be, um, I forgot what our name is going to be. But look for that change. It's being built now. Uh so this gold medical jobs. It's going to be a medical jobs channel. That's what we're going to be. Medical jobs channel. And we will be there and we will continue to be here and be there uh, as the name change takes over. You'll see me in both places. And we are all about uh, making uh, jobs, job seekers and um, job employers in the healthcare world find one another. So yeah, Gold Medical Jobs will, will uh, transform itself into Medical Jobs uh, channel. And so uh, maybe that will be helpful for more and more people. And we, we sure need you. And uh, you're in my thoughts and my heart. And uh, we're, as you've been hearing in so many places, uh, we're in this together. And try to be kind and take a break when you need to. And uh, that's about all I can give you for today. I hope I haven't rambled on too long. I will see you again. And uh, happy Passover and happy Easter and happy springtime to everyone. Um, I hope you have enough to eat and that you feel well and that um, you're being kind to one another. Thanks.